How is everybody? Good morning. So today we're going to be talking about Purple Team in 301. What I'd like to do is um, kind of got my start being a regular infrastructure engineer, kind of started out at the help desk and kind of worked my way up. Uh, started out kind of you know, working in IR and things like that. And what really, the reason why I kind of developed this presentation was because I've been coming to Secure Delaware for probably about six years now. I think, I think this is my sixth Secure Delaware. I've been speaking at two, and what I'd like to usually bring to Secure Delaware is a free control, something that's absolutely free, because I know we have a lot of small towns, municipalities, things like that. Um, so last year, I did a presentation on DMARC. that actually turned out really, really well, just basic email security and frameworks. Uh, but this time, really wanted to try to enable or empower some of the local municipalities and things like that to be able to kind of verify uh, whether or not they're getting the most out of their EDR. Sean's kind of said it in the other room during the keynote. You know, how do we make sure that we're holding our EDRs accountable? How do we make sure that we're holding our MSSPs accountable? So in order to do that, you know, we can leverage a free utility called Atomic Red, and, Atom and that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. So today, you know, a quick show of hands. How, how many of us in here, small or big, actually have an MSSP working for us? Some type of SOC as a service, something along those lines. Not many, not many. So do a lot of people run like an internal SOC, their own SOC? Some people don't, don't okay, let, let's do it this way. Raise your hand if you don't have a SOC or an MSSP at all. Okay, okay. All right, so the goal is though, have you ever wanted to try to verify that your MSSP is properly monitoring your environment? Sean said it during the keynote. With a particular engagement with a particular customer, he was able to get domain admin in just a few minutes. If someone came into your environment, whether a threat actor or not, maybe it's just a regular consultant, do you, is, is your SOC going to alert you whether or not they drop somebody into domain admins? And how long is it going to take you to get that alarm? That's privilege escalation, right? So have you ever wanted a more cost-effective way of validating your security tooling? You know, controls and uh, outside of just a traditional pen test. How many people in here have a traditional yearly pen test? Right? Lots of hands. Lots of hands. Do any of your security tools go off during those pen tests? Keep your hand up if they do go off. Okay, so we got some. But not everybody kept their hand up. So, right? That tells us right then and there that we have a gap in our detection technologies. Okay? So we can use this for that. Have you ever had a pen test where your MSSP never alerted to a single command RAM before the bad guys got in, right? So we want to be able to alert on that. Or have you ever just wanted to mature your detection response program internally? Uh, Sean said it again. Next, uh, next door, he was talking about right sourcing, right? Bringing in your own people. We don't necessarily need to outsource everything. We don't need to even outsource a SOC. Now, it is nice to have an MSSP, right? We need to be able to sleep. You know, our security engineers need to be able to sleep. I need to be able to sleep. I, you know, I, you know, at my organization, we use an MSSP as well, okay? Um, so, it, you know, it's important to be able to sleep, but we have to also enable our team to grow and things like that. So, you know, we try to do that without having a red team. So, a little bit about who, who am I. Uh, my name is Jason Wright. Uh, education came from UMGC. I actually went to Chesapeake myself. That's why I, went, I wanted to go back there and teach. Um, I, like, I like teaching because I really do feel like there's a bit of a talent deficit here on the Delmarva as a whole. Not necessarily just Delaware, but on the general Delmarva. Um, so I'm trying to help put a dent in that. So that's actually why I went back and got my master's. Um, I've been, uh, you know, technical security experience in the financial sector for about four years. I've been in the financial sector for about four years. I'm currently a, sec a senior security engineer at Convera you know, Global Payments Org. I got seven years of security experience across my career, but I've been in IT for over a decade now. I can't believe I can even say that. Um, I was a mechanic before I got into IT. Um, right now, I also serve as adjunct faculty at Chesapeake Community College. Prior to that, I also did um, around like 2019 when Hafium was a big deal. Um, I was an on-premise exchange admin for years. That's what really got me into security. Um, it really got me into IR, so I ended up starting to do like IR co uh, consulting for a few years for a company called Blue Team Alpha and uh, worked for them for a couple times just restoring Active Directory and Exchange environments. So that's kind of where my expertise kind of lies. Uh, Certification-wise, got my GCIH. I like IR. I like it when stuff's on fire. I'm, I'm usually the calm, cool, collective person in the room. Uh, so I like that type of stuff. Uh, Used to run a logarithm shop, not so much anymore, but I got some search from them, got the CompTIA trio, stuff like that. 
for today. Uh, we already covered the why. We're here in the intros. We're going to talk about blue, purple, red, which is what I like to call my security program methodology. We build out our defenses. We start simulating attacks against our defenses, and then we kind of bring in red teamers if we ever get to that particular type of maturity. Uh, we'll go over the technical prereqs for this and the lab architecture. I designed this with the thought, pro you know, I made this in my own home lab. You guys can absolutely make it in your own home lab as well uh, for students that are here, right? You can make this same environment at home. Everything that I've used in this demonstration is completely free. You don't need to pay a single dime for it. I use Splunk Enterprise for free. You get a free trial for that. Uh, typically, a sales rep's going to reach out to you. You know, you say you're a student. They're going to let you go, and you can, you can kind of go on your way. But that gives you a sim to work out of, Atomic Reg free, stuff like that, OK? So we'll talk about the uh, architecture of the lab. Uh, we're going to run a couple Atomic Red simulations. Uh, really, really basic stuff that was going to be easy to demonstrate and easy to show. Uh, things like uh, take, uh, making a local account. Right, so just like what uh, Sean said next door again, he said one of the, his customers that he had all had the same local admin across all of their workstations, right? So we wanna be able to use a free control cyber arcs here, right, to throw a little nod to them. Uh, you know, you could use their utility. Microsoft has their own utility as well with Laps, and they actually even matured that out, so now it even integrates into Azure and things like that, so Laps is a great utility uh, for locking down local accounts, but if somebody were to make a local account on one of your endpoints in your environment for persistence, are you gonna get an alarm for that? This is how we can engineer that alarm, okay? Same thing for domain accounts. If somebody outside of your IAM team, let's say you're not big enough to have a dedicated IAM team, let's say it's just your IT team that's creating provisioning accounts. If somebody outside of that you know, end up having some type of priv uh, privilege creep or privilege escalation or something along those lines, are you going to get an alarm for someone creating a domain account in your environment, right? So we can uh, use Atomic Red to help uh, generate the data we can use to uh, create these alarms. Uh, so we'll do that. We have another one for process injection and process hollowing. Really, that kind of uh, dives into EDRs. Uh, obtaining credentials from password stores, this is a big one, right? If you have somebody in your environment, if they actually try to dump the SAM from a local workstation or one of your servers or something like that, you know, is your EDR going to allow that to run, right? Do you know if your EDR is going to allow that to run? That's why we run these types of tests, okay? We'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to improve and save some time for questions at the end. All right, so blue, purple, red. This is my sort of methodology for building out a security program. Um, I like it because, hey, I used to be a blue teamer. I wanted to get into the red team side of the house. I knew I was never going to be a 100% you know, pen tester. It just wasn't my thing. Uh, but I like to kind of like be in that middle ground where I know enough to kind of do some harm, but I, you know, I can still kind of build up my own controls and things like that. So blue teaming, right? This is the group responsible for defending the enterprise. Uh, you know, used for, you know, defend information systems, they're responsible for security posture, probably responsible for your IR plan and things like that. You know, if something goes wrong, these are the people that are fielding alarms in your environment, typically reaching out to users, hey, why are you doing that? Why are you trying to run some software that we didn't already approve? Things like that, right? Then we have our red teamers. Now, a lot of our environments, we're probably not going to be able to afford a, you know, to have a dedicated red teamer just in there pen testing stuff all the time. If you can afford that, you, know, you probably already have a blue team program built out that that red teamer is going to be able to work very closely with. But for you know, all intents and purposes, most of the small environments that we have here on the Delmarva, we're probably not going to be able to have 100% red team uh, or someone just devoted to red team activities. So this is where purple teaming comes in, right? You know, that middle ground. So purple team is a group of cyber professionals who simulate malicious attacks and penetration testing in order to identify security vulnerabilities and then recommend strategies for mitigation, right? You know, got that straight from CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike's, you know, a big proponent for Purple Teaming. They have a lot of great articles. They have a lot of things built into their actual EDR platform for Purple Teaming that makes it really, really nice. Um, so unlike traditional red teams, Purple Teams work closely together with our blue team to build out more fruitful alarms, better alerting, better parsers, so that we can have a more secure environment and start to get rid of some of that noise that we get from our traditional sims. So blue, purple, red, right? 
Blue team sets up our defenses, creates the alarms, creates the monitors. They build the parsers. They're the ones going through the logs to do everything. Typically, this is going to be your MSSP. This is going to be your SOC. This is going to be your second, your, your security engineers. This is going to be your SecOps team, right? Typically in-house and affordable. A lot of us have our own internal blue team. Okay, red teams attack the defenses, they find holes, they test vulnerabilities, offensive engineers, penetration testers, you know, maybe even outside contractors and stuff like that. However, these pen testers, you know, they all want to get paid, they got their OSCPs and stuff like that. They can generally be expensive. So generally we contract them out, we do that once a year or something like that, right? It's too expensive to bring in house all the time. So best of both worlds, we have a purple teamer. Somebody that maybe has interest on the blue team that wants to kind of progress their skill set, just as what Sean said next door, we right size that talent. You know, if, if we have someone that has an interest to start doing attack simulation and stuff like that, we should allow them to go, to go down that path, maybe bring in a junior engineer so that they can take that person underneath their wing, start training them in the ways of the blue team, and then that way that engineer can progress their skill set and, and uh, keep moving up in the company, okay? So affordable, generally a blue team member that wants to explore red team, uh, the red team side, improve defenses through continuous attack simulations versus point in time that we get with pen testing, right? With, with purple teaming, we're gonna have, auto, you know, we can actually automate some of this stuff. Where penetration testing, you're only gonna get that point in time that you actually run the penetration test, okay? A couple, a couple of technical prereqs here. Atomic Red, so Atomic Red is a library of tools that can be found online. Uh, you can execute against uh, your controls. The tests are focused against MITRE. Sometimes they have a few dependencies. Those dependencies could be things like uh, Office being installed, uh, certain packages of Python and stuff like that. So we have uh, a couple prerequisites with Atomic Red, but um, you know, not anything extraordinary. Uh, Splunk Enterprise, quick nod to Splunk. The rep was trying to sell, uh, I, I guess I registered for the college, she was trying to sell this thing like crazy to me, but I was like, hey, I'm just an adjunct here, I'm not even on the IT team. So, uh, so latest version will suffice. You know, this is a great experiment for students though. Build out your home lab. I, always, I even tell my students that building out your own home lab is gonna help send your skill set through the roof. It kind of lets you practice and tinker with things. Um, there's a lot of you know, students that I get that they might not, you know, coming into my program, they might not have even like ever reset a password. By the time they leave my program, they would know how to install Active Directory, reset passwords and things like that and know the risks kind of associated with that. Uh, so important to have that Active Directory skill set. So we have that on here. Um, a little bit of PowerShell. You don't need to be an expert scripter. You just need to know enough of just how PowerShell works in order to kind of get through this. Uh, a couple other things, you should have PowerShell auditing turned on for your domain. So if, you're, if you do stand this up in a home lab, make sure you go into group policy, change your default group policy, turn on uh, script block logging, make sure you have PowerShell auditing turned on. Otherwise, you're not gonna get the noise into the sim that you need in order to be able to generate alarms and progress, okay? Um, other than that, for one of the exercises, there was Microsoft Office. I do believe I ended up yanking that one out um, just because the, uh, the EDR I was, I was trying to demo at the time uh, was just not allowing, um, ma not allowing macros to run. So really, really simple architecture, Windows Server 2016 with Active Directory, uh, Directory services installed. Uh, force level and domain force functional levels are 2016. Default domain policy, right, already talked about that. Uh, module and block level logging is enabled. Uh, there's just a, two machines in this environment for me, two virtual machines. Sectel DC1 made it just for this, that's gonna be our domain controller. Sectel desktop one, that's gonna be Windows 10 Enterprise. It's just a regular domain member. I do have the Windows 10 RSAT tools installed. That just makes it a little bit easier to kind of talk back and forth with the domain controller and search purpose for the lab environment. And then both machines have Splunk Enterprise installed. The reason why I have to do that, and you'll have to do that too if you decide to do this lab, is because um, <coughs> log forwarding. The actual SIM service runs on the domain controller. That's not best practice. Please don't do that in your enterprise environment. But uh, for, for this particular use case, it was easier just to point the desktop to the domain controller and just have all the logs go that way. So with uh, forwarding enabled on Sectel Desktop 1 uh, to Sectel DC 1, generally, again, not best practice to have your SIM running on your DC. Really, really simple diagram, right? Not anything crazy going on here. 
We have our desktop running Windows 10. That's going to just forward logs over to the uh, Splunk service running on Sectel DC1. Uh, it's forwarding on port 9997. Um, Splunk in Active Directory Domain Services is installed over there. This is just a regular desktop member. Both of these machines have a firewall sitting in front of them that allows them to get out and talk to the internet to be able to download the scripts. All right, so go ahead and get into Attack Sim 1. So really what we're doing here is taking two of the exercises from uh, T1136. They break them down uh, into sub-exercises. One's going to be for creating a local account, and one's going to be for creating a domain account. So if you go to Atomic Reb's website, over on the side, uh, on, on this far side here, uh, you can see just a list of the tests. Creating a user on a Linux system, creating a user account on Mac system, uh, creating a new user in command prompt, creating a new user in PowerShell. All of these are tests that we can run to generate some noise into our sim to be able to see if we can generate any type of alerting from it. Okay, uh, the particular exercise we're going to be doing is over here. So super easy to run. So uh, this essentially creates a new user using PowerShell. Uh, upon execution, uh, details about the new account will be displayed in the PowerShell session. Uh, to verify that the new account is there, you can run net user. I actually just go into Active Directory, find the user, and show you guys that way. Uh, there's, there's, sometimes there are variables that they'll add in here um, for like passwords, usernames, and things like that. Um, so keep an eye out. If you do go to the Atomic Red page, sometimes they have pre-built variables. If they have any dependencies as well, they'll show you the dependencies uh, on the attack page. Okay. So running the attack. Not anything crazy going on here. I'll, all I did here was just a quick copy-paste. That's how easy this is. Right? It's, we don't have to make it any more complicated than what, you know, than what we're doing. So all we're doing here is two commands. The best thing about Atomic Red, they give you the command that you need to run in order to, to generate the noise, and then they give you a command to clean it up after you're done. So you're not necessarily leaving a bunch of nonsense in your environment. You can clean it up when you're done. Now, ideally, don't do this in your prod environment or anything like that. Make sure you have like a little dev niche or something kind of set off to the side. If your you know, shop's too small and you don't have the ability to have your own kind of like dev domain or something like that, set up, you know, just like what I did, set up a maybe a, a, a dedicated domain controller or just another machine off to the side of your environment that has all of your controls already installed, all of your, you know, your EDRs installed, your sim agents on there. Make sure you, that, that you can see logs coming across, you know, stuff like that. Okay? So all we're going to do is run the command. All we did over there is just run the command. We actually set it with no password. Boom. New user is true. What we did here was create a local user. So on the endpoint, in Windows logs, this is what we're looking at, right? So this is what's coming across the wire. You know, new local user, username, da 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 da. If you go into computer management, you can see hashtag username is there. And then here is the valuable information. This is what we need to do. It says PowerShell.exe execute, uh, execute a command line, new dash local user. Now, after we run this, Ideally, in a Euphoria world, we're going to get some type of alarm from our SOC, our MSSP. If they have the visibility, we're going to get that noise. They're going to see this. Now, we verified that we have the noise on the endpoint. So what does it look like once it actually hits Splunk? So over here on the far right side, that's what it looks like when it actually hits Splunk. So we verified the noise on the endpoint. Right? We have that log. We know that information is there. We, we now verified that that same data is in our SIM. So at this point, our MSSP should have an alarm for this. This is a persistence technique. It's mapped to MITRE. But in this you know, use case, this is my lab, I did not have an alarm engineered. So what should we do? All I did for this particular query is set the host name to Sectel Desktop. Source is going to be the Windows event log, and then the event code is going to be the PowerShell event, uh, the event code 800. So you can run, you know, if you run the same attack you, and you follow my lab architecture here, you'll be able to take that uh, string that's up there at the top, run that in your Splunk environment, and you're going to get the same output if everything's set up correctly. Now, 
this is my sim, right? It's, this is all the test environment. You know, it's not set up to necessarily alarm. So in this particular use case, we would have to engineer the alarm. But this is when you would kind of sit around and wait for your MSSP to, to do something or not. And then probably go out and start asking questions. Uh, for this particular use case, we're going to keep going on with the test. So uh, in, in this particular one, right, we're just kind of cleaning up that local user account. That's what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that uh, you can just run those uh, remove commands and it cleans everything up nice and tidy for you. Super easy. So creating a domain account, right, we're just kind of moving down the list. This script is a little bit more involved. They have a couple placeholders up here at the top. Not actually using them. We're going to kind of keep going on. Um, I'm just going to take their script and just create it the way it is. Uh, clean up commands, same deal. It's going to say net username and it's going to delete it and verify that the value comes back as null. So running the attack, right? We can take this, drop this into PowerShell ISE. Uh, run the command, and then even though we do get a error up here at the top because it's like, hey, this password doesn't seem to meet the password policy, you know, this is a, a domain that doesn't have a whole bunch of hardening turned on, right? This is my lab environment. I'm just trying to get noise into the sim. So in this particular use case, we actually got output, and it actually created the user account in the domain. So if we go down, this is my domain, super basic, right? The user is down here at the bottom. What does that look like from a log perspective? Well, this particular script is going to create a couple different ones. You can see that I ran it using PowerShell ISE. And then we can see all of the uh, convert strings and stuff like that down here. And we can actually see the password value coming across in the logs as well. So again, this is another one of those points where will your MSSP that you have, that you're paying money to help watch your environment for you, are they going to alert if a random user just gets spooled up in your environment that somebody outside the IT team creates? Maybe you want that noise, maybe you don't, but this is a way that you can create some noise to be able to test that. So what does this look like on the sim? Boom, same log over here on the sim. Super easy. So this is really, really simple, attack sim but this is creating persistence within your environment, right? Uh, you know, if you go around, you do a little bit of discovery, you might find that you have the same local admin on all of your workstations. If you have that in your environment, an attacker is going to be able to move laterally once they figure out what that password is, right? All right, so just reflecting on this one real quick. Do we have the proper logging on the endpoint, right? Can we see the logs on the endpoint? After we did all of that, can we actually see it? Do we have the right group policy settings enabled? Okay. Then, do we have the proper logging on the SIM? Can, you know, is the SIM getting logs from the endpoint? Do they have to hit some type of Windows event collector or something like that before they get up to the SIM? How does the SIM ingest those logs? It's important to know that architecture. Okay. And then, are we being alerted? Maybe we don't want to be alerted. Maybe we want to tune our alarm so that we only get alerted when somebody outside of the IT team creates these accounts. Okay? So it's all about tuning what's right. What, you know, what do we care about? What don't we care about? We might not care if our IT team is creating users. That's their job. Okay? Maybe we do care if somebody from you know, finance gets privilege creep somehow, their account gets popped, and then they start creating users, right? That's what we're trying to avoid here. And that's really easy to parse out. You can parse out by group, you can parse out by usernames, and things like that. And then are we setting the logs in a format that can be parsed? Depending on what sim you're using and things like that, certain uh, EDRs, uh, Windows event logs come over in like a giant blob. Okay, and it's really, really hard to parse them out. So things like Sumo Logic, some of these next gen sims and things like that, what they're actually going to be looking for, or you have the ability to convert to, you can take your Windows logs, turn them into JSON format, and it just makes tuning these alarms a million times easier. Okay. All right. So the next one's going to actually be process Halloween. So. Process Halloween, uh, uh, all right, so my notes are all over here. Um, I'm just going to kind of keep running, uh, keep rolling with it. So Process Halloween is when we're actually going to take a process, say like Notepad EXE, we're going to make it so that we are going to uh, 
map a separate binary, maybe a separate DLL file or a separate binary to notepad.exe so that when notepad.exe runs or maybe you see notepad.exe running in your task manager or something along those lines, it's actually running, you know, crypto gotcha.exe, right, for lack of better words. So in this particular use case, uh, Atomic Red gives us all that we need in, the, in order to be able to run this. So super, super nice. Uh, so the test uses PowerShell to create an, uh, a hollow from a PE on a disk uh, with Explorer, the uh, process, explorer.exe, right? Everybody knows explorer.exe, running as the actual parent process. So they actually gave a little bit of credit to Fuzzy Security that actually came out with this, but again, um, it, you know, it's a good, it's a good attack sim. So we have a couple variables here, hollow binary path, parent process name, sponsor binary path, and spawn2 process name. So what, you know, essentially what we're doing here is taking cmd.exe, we are going to actually map that out to Explorer, and then, you know, the path to it is going to be through Notepad. Um, over here is actually the script. Now, there is a GitHub for Atomic Red, so you can actually go straight to the GitHub. You can get their dependencies straight from GitHub, so it makes it really, really, really easy, okay? And there's some cool automation we can talk about towards the end, too. Um, the actual script over here, it actually goes over quite a bit. We, you know, we're not going to get into that nuance, but this is essentially what you're doing. You're copy-pasting the script in the PowerShell uh, uh, ISE. You're filling it in with the uh, uh, variables that they supply you. And then again, we have a way of cleaning this up so we're not muddying up our environment. So running the attack, again, PowerShell.exe, boom, we can see that um, this is basically just a script. All I did was just take in their variables. Executing this, we can see everything that executed. Start hollow.ps1, boom, as soon as it actually starts to execute that process, command prompt's going to open with the name of hollow. So that's our hollowed session. That's running as notepad.exe. Now, this is not the best, you know, Windows event logs is not the best method for capturing this type of data, right? You're relying on your EDR, your MDR type of solution to grab this type of data out. You, you want to be able to try to get those processes before they launch. A good EDR is going to be able to detect process hollowing and try to see the fact that uh, command prompt is running under notepad.exe, and that's going to set off that alarm. But that's half the reason why we're running this. Is this going to set off an alarm? Is this actually going to run? If it does run, that's a problem. We need to fix that. So what does this look like from the uh, endpoint perspective? It looks like someone just ran a script called starthollow.ps1, right? Not anything super crazy. But we're not going to get, you know, you know, we're not running sys internals here or anything like that. So we're not necessarily parsing that out. So we're relying on our EDR. So then the questions really become, does our EDR see this? Are our logs from our EDR being forwarded to our central alerting source? Are they being forwarded to our SOAR if we're operating out of a SOAR? If our SecOps team is operating out of a SOAR, is that where it's going? If it's just, if it's just going to a SOC, is the SOC alerting? Can the SOC see this? Are they seeing this in whatever EDR, you know, CrowdStrike, whatever, are they seeing this there? Did it just get prevented? So always check with your EDR when it comes to processes. But that's what it looks like on the endpoint, and then again, that's what it looks like there. Now, this might still be fruitful information to parse out. Maybe our regular users should not be running PowerShell scripts, right? I don't know too many people, like in, in some of my older jobs that were part of just general operations that needed to sit there and run PowerShell. So it, that might be a big enough of a red flag or something that we can parse out that's like, hey, somebody outside of the IT team is running something.ps1 that's unsigned maybe that's a big problem, right? Maybe we want to be alerted to that type of information. So this is what it looks like on the sim. Same deal as the last one. We would pick out our fields, we would engineer alarms based on what we can parse out of there that we find valuable, and then we move on. Ideally though, we would correlate something like running a PowerShell script for a particular user along with that user starting some type of hollowed process. So then we have intelligent alerting, right? Now we're not necessarily just getting alerted to a user launching a PowerShell script, we're getting alerted to a user launching a PowerShell script that launched a hollowed out process, right? That's the type of intelligent alerting that your SecOps team wants so they're not necessarily chasing their tails, uh, you know, just chasing random alarms and noise that are coming into the sim. 
So quick reflection, do we have the proper logging on the endpoint? We showed that we did. Is it in the EDR? Do we have proper logging on the SIM? Right? We showed that we did. Are we getting alarms? You know, is that what we care about? Maybe it's not. Are we sending logs in a format that can be parsed? And should we be forwarding logs from the EDR to the SIM? If you have a cloud-based solution, it might be way too noisy. It might be way too noisy. If you're running like a Sumo Logic or something like that, the cloud, you know, yes, the cloud is another computer. The cloud also costs money. And those logs take bandwidth. You're going to have to pay for bandwidth to ship the logs out. You're going to have to pay for storage on, on like the Sumo Logic end or whatever it is that you're using in your shop. Okay? So we have to make sure whatever logs that we're sending to these aggregators, we need to determine whether or not it's actually fruitful or worthwhile. All right? How are we doing? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. All right. We're rocking and rolling. We'll get through all of them. All right. So attack sim three. This one, super basic. This is one you guys could do from your, you know, your local laptop while you're sitting here eating lunch or something like that. But this is just obtaining passwords from the credential store. So there are various crack, uh, cache credentials on various locations on Windows workstations. Uh, somebody can grab, you know, you know, go into app data for Google Chrome. If you got saved passwords in Google Chrome, you can grab them right out of there, right? That's one place that you can get them. Uh, the other one is the SAM or the Security Account Manager Hive in Windows. Really, really sensitive hive. We want to make sure we can protect that. Right? I see some heads nodding, so I think some people know where I'm going with this. So how are we actually going to run the attack? This is super easy. Command prompt. All we're going to do is just save the registry and just take it offline. This is exactly what an attacker is going to do. They're going to do this, take it offline, and then try to actually brute force it. Okay? So they'll take your hashes. They could either then use patch the hash if it's a domain account that they actually find worthy. Maybe it has domain admin per, uh, permissions or something along those lines. Or maybe it's just a local user. Right? or somebody that logged in, if they can take those uh, cache credentials offline, take those hashes offline, they can sit there, brute force them offline, stand up a cloud instance in AWS or something like that, and just let John the Ripper roll. Okay? So here, the local SAM, um, the SAM and system uh, cache credentials and LSA secrets can be enumerated by three registry keys. That's how easy. It is not difficult. This could be a sim uh, you know, simple bash script or, ba or a batch file that you know, an attacker could run on any workstation. right? So we need to make sure that our EDR is going to catch this and prevent it. Um, Defender ATP, I don't really give too many nods to Microsoft anymore, but Defender ATP is actually really, really solid at grabbing this type of stuff. So if you are like an E5 customer or something like that, um, you, know, you have access to that EDR if you, know, if you want it. Uh, essentially here, though, Run with uh, command prompt. It can require elevation, or, or it should require elevation in your environment, unless everybody's a domain admin. Hopefully not. Um, but a command's the run. Reg save uh, uh, local key machine, uh, local machine, uh, SAM system and security, and then same deal for the cleanup commands. Right? It's just going to go back through and jack. And, and just delete those files out. So what does that look like over there on the far side? We can see what it looks like in the command prompt. Boom, operation completed successfully. Then we actually have the files. Boom, done. That easy. Now they have all you know, the hash versions of the local passwords for that particular workstation. right? And then now they can take that stuff offline. So, um, so what does login look like on the endpoint? Well, in the beginning, we talked about PowerShell logging. Right? By default, in any domain environment, PowerShell logging is not turned on. So if you don't have it turned on or you don't think you have it turned on, more than likely it's not turned on. I can tell you that right now. Uh, script block logging is another type of logging that you would have to enable. That still kind of equates out to PowerShell, though. But uh, uh, command prompt, completely separate GPO. You have to go through and configure a separate GPO for command prompt. So, that's the gist here. So we actually went through, turn on uh, audit process creation. It's actually going to, so it's going to see command prompt launch reg.exe, right? Be able to go into the registry and be able to see that. So it's actually going to audit that and dump that to the event log so that we could actually see what happened. So we could see command prompt, you know, creator process name, com, uh, uh, cmd.exe is launching reg.exe. Okay? Simple enough. So that's what we're actually going to be looking to parse out on the endpoint. From the SIM perspective, it looks exactly the same. So we just verified that we had the alarm there or, or that we had the data there. So now we can hold the MSSP accountable. So that's essentially you know, the gist there. Right? Are we, can those commands run? Ideally, in, the, in a Defender ATP world, what I'm experienced with, also with CrowdStrike, as soon as something tries to dump the SAM, 
It's going to actually uh, get rid of the command prompt. It's going to kill that session, and it's going to set off an alarm that someone actually tried to dump it. So if you are a CrowdStrike customer, generally that's actually engineered out of the bag. Uh, if you're a Defender ATP customer, it's actually going to launch the command prompt. It's going to see what it's doing. It's going to shut it down and then actually set off an alarm. But are we getting those alarms? That's the whole purpose of this, right? So how do we improve? PowerShell auditing, it's turned off by default. We've got to make sure it's turned on. If it's not turned on, we need to make sure we go back and turn it on. Be as verbose as possible. Uh, but understand, we have logging limits, we have data constraints, bandwidth constraints, all of these things. Um, so take all of that into mind when you're uh, running some of this. Some of these logs, some of these audit logs can be really, really noisy. So it's really important to kind of tune out uh, what's worthwhile and what's not. Um, command prompt logging, guess what? It's also turned off by default. Script block logging. Same deal, turned off by default. So make sure we have these things off. Or that's going to another tool. Um, CrowdStrike's actually really, really good. Another nod. They actually have a separate kind of pane in Falcon that actually dumps all of the PowerShell logs uh, to a dedicated menu. So you can actually find that. It's buried under the endpoint settings and stuff like that, but you can find that. Um, are we logging all the things? Log all the things and then start to ratchet back whatever you find is super noisy. You will find some super noisy things. But we need to make sure we're uh, logging our domain controllers. Make sure we're logging Active Directory, Directory services. Uh, hopefully no one has Exchange on-prem. If you're one of those people out there though, you know, make sure you're logging your IIS services and stuff like that. Happy was a mess, um, but it made me a lot of money back in the day, so I don't, I'm not necessarily upset about it. Um, endpoints, right? Make sure we're logging our endpoints. Yeah, you know, you know, we can, you know, if we're a total cloud hosted environment in AWS, right? That's great. Everything's up in the cloud. But you know, if Joe Smo's laptop at home gets popped, we need to know about that. It's not enough to just know what's happening within your particular cloud. Okay? So essential logging. Save your SecOps team some hassle. We don't like more dashboards. Really, for us, consolidation enables us to be a little bit more agile. So sometimes less tools mean more. Ideally, we have some type of centralized logging, whether we throw that all to a SIM, maybe we throw everything to a SIM, and then we have the SIM feed a SOAR. You know, there's a million different ways to kind of architect out your SecOps program. Um, ideally, though, have some type of centralized logging. If you have a web application that drives your business, right, are you getting those logs? Really, really important, right? If it drives your business and you're not getting those IIS logs or whatever type of web server it is that you're running, if you're not getting those logs, you know, your crown jewels are just kind of like sitting out there and you're not, you know, you're not, you're not really protecting them. Uh, beyond that, test your MSSP, okay? Um, their job is to protect you, run simulations regularly, test their alerting capacity, okay? If they don't alarm, work with them to create better parsers to improve not only alerting for your environment, but for their other customers as well. I've had a couple MSSPs that I've worked with over the years try to use uh, you know, running things like Atomic Red as a cash grab. And that is by far, that is not the type of people you want on your team. You want a MSSP that is gonna see you running this and be like, okay, yep, we did an alert to this. Let's actually you know, kind of work together uh, to build out these parsers uh, because in the end, that's going to help them protect not only your environment but other customers' environments as well. Okay? So that's going to help them alert, uh, you know, just improve their own alerting capacity. And then automate testing. right? So you can mature this out farther by automating this and tracking the results to resolutions. Right? It's not enough to just do this and just you know, send a ticket off to the MSSP and just hope that everything's good and move on. Right? After they say that they built out new parsers for you, you should be testing them again. Run another test, run another simulation, verify that what you uh, want is there. Okay? Otherwise, you're doing it all for nothing, you're just kind of wasting time. Um, this helps to prove technical KPIs that executives can understand. Right? So we understand how important it is to alert when we have you know, new local users being created. Okay? Our executive board probably isn't going to care about that. But when our CISO goes to the board and says, hey, you know, we just ran an attack sim, completely mapped to MITRE's persistence uh, metric, and you know, we validated that you know, like the top 10 things, uh, you know, we were able to alert to them or something along those lines. So just be able to articulate it uh, to the uh, C-level suite a little bit better, be able to drive some KPIs. Hey, we have better alarms. Um, there are free products out there. SANS, uh, SANS, just to throw a nod out to them, um, they have a great purple teaming guide. Uh, they have uh, 
a, a huge PowerPoint slide. If you look up like SANS Purple Team in 2023, um, you'll see it, it's like a hundred and some page PowerPoint that has a whole bunch of Purple Team tools. One of them is Vector. It's another Purple Team and utility that you can basically uh, automate um, Atomic Red to run from. And then it takes all of those tests, it gathers all of that data that you can parse out, uh, takes all that data, dumps it into the platform, and then determines whether or not that, that, that attack was successful, and then gives you a nice bar graph of successful attacks versus uh, you know, attacks that were thwarted, or maybe you were alerted to, or, or something along those lines. So it gives you a GUI-based way of kind of delivering some really, really good uh, KPIs and things like that. Um, you can also fully automate some of Atomic Red. Uh, they have what's called Atomic Runner. For PowerShell, they have called, uh, it's called Invoke Atomic. But you can essentially automate some of this testing out. So eventually, you, know, you start dabbling and just running a couple attack sims that you find interesting or that someone on your team finds interesting. Then you build upon that and start building the automation around that so you have it going continuously. And what's that going to help prevent? That config drift. Right, you know the lack. You know you might be able to find that it's like, hey, why are we not getting alerts for local users being created on this endpoint, but we get it on this endpoint? Turns out we're missing our EDR agent or something like that over there on the other endpoint. Uh, beyond that, just being an IR person and doing IR contracted for a few years, you know, find your crown jewels in your environment. Um, outside of domain controllers and authentication and stuff like that, figure out what drives the business. Set up more alarms around your crown jewels, right? Protect your crown jewels, protect what is you know, running the business and generating money because that's how you know, the security team gets paid. You know, security team can be a, you know, a bit of a money sink, right? So we need to make sure that we're milking every dollar we can. Um, let the blue teamers hone their craft as an organization. Uh, you know, an organization doesn't need a red team or annual pen test. Unless for compliance, of course, right? If we have to have compliance, if there's some reason why we need to have a red team kind of come in and perform a pen test, we can have them come in. But you know, allow your blue teamers to build their craft and start to you know, test different things, OK? And then incorporate threat intelligence into pre-existing alerting through sticks and taxi feeds, right? Most of your sims out there, they, you know, you know, for my org, we're in financial industry. You know, in in the financial industry, uh, you know, we have uh, intelligence and stuff like that that we actually get from curated sources that we like to build in, and it gives us more intelligent alerting. Right? I'm not talking about something like Alien Vault or something like that, but you know, for us, we use stuff like FSI Zach and things like that. Okay, so you can get better alerting through some of these other separate intelligence feeds. Okay, huh. I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? No? Not one? Man, I must have did pretty good. <laughs> no? Go ahead. I, did, yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion on some of the, uh, I know there's a field of like branch attack and simulation software. Some of the commercial stuff you may have used, like simulate attack IQ. Attack IQ, yeah. Yeah. How does that like compare to something like uh, Vector that you mentioned? So, so vector, vector is like a GUI way of kind of like mapping out this. I would not necessarily say that it is, it is by far, but it's not going to run Atomic Red by itself. Absolutely not. Attack IQ, you can bring Attack IQ in, and it, it's going to do this. You're going to pay Attack IQ money for basically running Atomic Red tests. They just found a really, really pretty way of taking those tests and running it you know, basically via you know, a, a separate server that, that runs their application. And then you start dropping agents, and, and that's how they start uh, kind of generating their noise. So yeah, there are paid versions out there. They're really, really good. They're really, really good, but you know, Again, you know, this is Delaware. We don't necessarily have all the money of the, some of the big states and around the DMV and stuff like that. So it's like, hey, you know, if we could do it with a free tool that allows us to enable our pre-existing internal security team, why not allow us to kind of you know, you know, hone our skill set a little bit more? Thanks. Good question. Go ahead. Does Atomic Red integrate with the SIM, or do you need like middleware to do that? So Atomic Red's just going to kind of be your noise generator. It's not going to directly integrate with like Splunk or anything like that. Um, I do believe Splunk and some of the bigger SIM vendors out there, they do have integrations with things like Attack IQ and stuff like that, where they, you know, they they have that partner to partner partnership type of deal where it's like, hey, you know, you want money, we want money, so let's just kind of com combine these two things together. We, uh, we'll help sell a couple of your licenses with our product when we onboard a new customer. So that's, you know, you know, for like Splunk and stuff like that, they do have integrations with like Attack IQ and stuff like that. But, you know, with something like Atomic Red, you're really just using it to kind of generate the noise on the endpoint. And uh, do you always do this in like a planned 
you know, kind of methodology, or is it like chaos in there and throwing it? Planned. So, so once, you know, you run it once, you get your CISOs buy-in, right? You get the, the CISOs like, you did what? And, and, and we're paying all of this money to this MSSP and we're not getting any alarms? Okay, no, let's start putting them to the fire a little bit more and start doing it a little bit more frequently uh, just to try to not only follow up on the prior tests that we ran, make sure that they're still good, but you know, that we're building upon this because Atomic Red adds stuff all the time. Um, I, I do believe there's even rumors of them having like an ICS OT type of uh, feed kind of coming through too where, you know, I'm, I'm not really in the manufacturing space, so I don't know a whole lot about that, but I've heard, I've, I've just kind of like heard some rumors. Yes, sir. Can Atomic Red or is there other software that can simulate data or database attacks? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there are, you know, Atomic Red has scripts for, for SQL that, you know, it'll try, you know, you know, again, don't do it in prod, but it'll try to drop a table. It'll definitely, you know, you, know, you want to get your DBAs to sweat a little bit, drop a table. Drop a table from dev, and I guarantee you that'll get you to, that'll definitely get them to patch some stuff. That'll definitely get them to patch the web application. Okay. Any others? No, we're good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Hope everybody had fun. Um, this is going to be available online if anybody wants access to it. I have all the scripts, uh, stuff from Atomic Red, stuff from CrowdStrike on here. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff. So be, you know, be sure to check out uh, the Sectel website. You know, if you want any more information, you know, this PowerPoint will be available up there. Thank you. On behalf of DTI in the state of Delaware, Jason, we'd like to thank you very much for thank your you, presentation. Sir. Thank you. Awesome.